For this next bit, I thought we would use the editor to just do a few simple engineering calculations. And I'm going to start this off here with a comment line. Comment start with a percent symbol or a hashtag. So I'm going to call this engineering constants. Here I'll do another example for a comment line. Always start programs with comments and include notes on all variables and processes. So this is a good practice to always start with maybe a little algorithm or discussion of, of what you're trying to accomplish. So next I'm going to add a few just engineering constants. This can be a program you can use in the future when you have a physics class maybe or chemistry that you would have a nice little reference guide for you. So we've got um, gravitational constant and I'm putting in some comment lines here to remind me of what units these numbers go along with. How about the Earth's radius, the Earth's mass in kilograms. So you can see how you can add those comments just right after the number and everything is color coded for you. So we're having just a few new variables that we're putting in here from standard engineering toolbox type constants. As you're working on programs, don't let yourself get too far before you compile it, before you run the program. And running this at first, it doesn't look like anything has happened. But if you come down to my workspace, you'll see that a few new variables have been added. And remember, Octave automatically declares these depending on what they, so these are all declared as doubles. Another thing you can do if you want a quick variable list is type WHO, or for more details, WHOS will give you a nice list, pretty much everything that's also in your workspace, but that's a convenient little thing to have. Some constants you just copy out of tables. Other constants, it might be nice to actually calculate and see where they're coming from. So let's say we want to calculate the Earth's gravitational acceleration. If you've taken physics, you know the gravitational force between two masses is equal to g times m times m divided by r squared, where g is the gravitational constant we just did. The two m's are the masses that the force is acting between, and then the radius, that's the distance between the center of mass of the two objects. So for objects on Earth, if you have F equals mg equals gmm over r squared, the small m cancels out, and you can get gravitational acceleration on Earth is equal to gm over r squared. So we can plug this guy in and then run it and see what kind of gravity we get for these numbers, and we can kind of check that we got all of our constants in there correctly, too. So let's go ahead and run this and see what valuable we get. So here, G9.8196, or I can come up to my command window and type in the variable that we've defined in the editor. And it's, it's also in here in the command window. OK, so what other constants shall we put in here? And this is what I want you to do as part of your lab, is think about what constants you use often in your homework. Because I'd like you to actually start using Octave in, in some of your STEM classes to complete some problems in here. So. Look up some constants, maybe conversion factors. Be sure and add comments on what the units are for what you're typing in. And then this will be a nice little reference sheet for you to have. So here we go. Boltzmann, Coulomb, charge of an electron, Bohr radius. There's some common ones. OK, what shall we calculate? Let's go ahead and compare the electric force to gravitational force for, atom, for the hydrogen atom. So what we did before was calculated gravity using the Earth's mass. Let's do the same thing, only now we're using the proton and electron mass and the Bohr radius. So same GMM over R squared equation. And next, I'm going to go ahead and write Coulomb's law, which is the force exerted by one charge and another charge that are separated some distance away from one another. So we're going to use the charges on electron and the Bohr radius. And then we can go ahead and compare the magnitude 
of those two forces to one another. Interesting that those two equations are so similar to one another. So let's go ahead and do that. And we can then answer the question, why is gravity called a weak force? Running this program to see what it spits out here. We have the force generated by Coulomb, the electrical charges. And here we have the force between proton and electron because of gravity, so Newton's law. And if you look at the ratio between these two, you'll see that gravity is 39 orders of magnitude smaller than the forces generated by those charges. So yes, gener gravitational force is very, very weak compared to electrical forces. So what other constants? I guess we better have the speed of light in there. That's as constant as it gets, right? And how about Planck's constant? Okay, I'm not gonna put all of them in there. I'll let you change this around. One more thing, pi. So how do you calculate pi? There's one way to approximate it with tangent, and you can compare that method to what Octave uses. Let's go ahead and run this and see what the output is. So we have an answer of one, and that's coming from the ratio of how Octave calculates pi and our approximation using the tangent. Pi is an interesting number, and different programs have different techniques to calculate it. If you actually go into WikiHow, there's some step-by-step -step on how to find pi, starting with just taking a circle and wrapping a piece of yarn around it and trying to get the circumference and go about it that way. It also comes up with um, this, the Gregory series, and this is just the tip of the iceberg, and it's an infinite series going on, and I'll show you how to do this in um, Octave to, to create that. If you happen to have any extra time, there's actually a lot of fun mathematical books that talk about the different constants. So like here is one, this is Beckman, A History of Pi, and it goes through some of the earlier approximations of pi all the way from, you know, Egypt and the Greeks and how people were trying to slowly and slowly square a circle. So you know how to get the, the area of a square, of course, which is one length times another length versus how do you get the area of a, of a circle. And it was a problem for a lot of people for a long time. So there's everything from how the Mayans tackled it to people in China. And it, it comes down to kind of splitting the circle up into slices of pizza and adding those triangles together and some very some very clever different things to do there's there's actually a whole series of books on just the different constants of numbers here's the um so history of pi this one is an imaginary tale so discovering how to use imaginary numbers um this one was e so exponents and zero. For a while, humanity didn't even have the use of zero. And of course, what links all of these numbers together is Euler's formula. And these are, so for your, um, for your lab, I want you to kind of think about some of the constants that we use, where they came from, if it's something that we don't have an exact value for, how do we get the closest value possible? And, how important is it that we do get a close value and how those constants are related to one another. So like here's e to the i pi plus one equals zero. That has exponent, imaginary number, pi, zero. It has all of it is all combined together in, in Euler's formula. So kind of think through some of those, maybe chat with a math teacher if you're in a math class and have some fun with finding some relationships between those constants. So let's get back into Octave and one more exercise, and that is to try out the Gregory Leibniz series. Hopefully I pronounced that right. I think that's a German name. We have someone who speaks German in class. <laughs> so to do this, we're going to need to use a 
couple of loops. And this is where you're going to remember a few things from your C++ days. So we'll set up a starting point and some counters and go ahead and just use a for loop. And right now I'm just going to set this for, let's see. Yeah, let's, I'll start it with five loops and then we'll expand that to quite a few more in the future to see it go. Okay, so if the remainder of i and 4 is equal to 3, this is a little trick if you have plus, minus, plus, minus. See how that series has alternating pluses and minuses? So that will give us a nice alternate with this if statement here so that we're subtracting 4 over i for part of it and adding it for the other half. And you notice that 1, 3, 5, 7. And at the end, we can go ahead and print this guy out. It'd be nice to see how many iterations we've ran around in this for loop for. And if we put a pause in here, we'll be able to see it run and watch the output get closer and closer to pi as it goes. So yeah, Octave have, has if statements, for statements, just like good old C++. So a lot of the things that we've done earlier in the semester should translate over here, which is one of the things that makes Octave and MATLAB pretty popular programs to use. Okay, finish typing this in here. So we're going to print the iterations out. And next we have to increment the next loop. And you'll notice this, this goes 4 over 1, 4 over 3, 4 over 5, over 7. So we're going to add 2 each time around. Okay, so there's our code. Okay, the moment of truth, we're going to hit the run button on this thing and see what happens. So here we see the first five iterations and we're getting close to three. Now let's get more daring and I'm going to change this from just going around the loop five times to how about a hundred. So now we're going to run it for a hundred times and we'll see if we get close to pi coming out of this thing. 3.15, so that's starting to get there. Okay, one more, 1,000 maybe. It seems to be running pretty quickly. Ooh, 3.14. So the more times we run around the loop, the closer we are to getting pi. Okay, so there's a little start on some basic calculations in Octave with a little, little bit of programming thrown in. Hope you see some fun possibilities for it.